Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Michaela, and I lead our marketing and our partnerships for Applied Information Sciences, or AIS for short. Today, we're sharing some common quick win use cases that cut across customers and industry trends. If you take one thing away from this session, I hope it's that there are a lot of applications for low code that can add agility, capability, and value to your organization. And sometimes the hardest part is simply getting started. The right partner and use case can make a big difference in your experience and how the adoption of low code for business outcomes plays out in your organization. There are three really great scenarios for our audience here today. Whether you already have Office 365 products or Power Apps licenses and haven't determined how to best leverage or roll out those services, or you have business processes or applications where you could apply low code for users spanning pro dev to business, we have some great use cases here to unblock your low code journey and put you on a path to realize value. Really excited to have a passionate and knowledgeable low code SME from AIS join us today. Nick? Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, my name is Nick Gill. I'm a solution architect here at AIS and also lead up our solution area for business applications. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of Power Platform is pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I started as a customer of the Microsoft stack there of Power Platform. Um, and, you know, you may have, have uh, kind of seen some of the, the different sessions that uh, maybe I'd spoken at it in Microsoft Ignite and, and, and sharing my low code journey and how really for me, Power Platform has been that gateway to learning. Now, I never thought that uh, I would be moving from uh, managing the supply chain there at American Red Cross to uh, moving into a highly technical role. Uh, but the reality is that you know, anyone can get started with Power Platform. And you can move that expertise in Power Platform to extend far beyond just Power Platform, being able to then, uh, for myself, learning more in diving into Azure and being able to even scale to build applications there on Azure, being able to work with data across the stack there with Synapse and, and being able to understand the synergy that comes between Power Platform and, uh, and Azure as part of that whole Microsoft One Cloud. Uh, it's really mind blowing. And so it's been a, a really cool opportunity to get to take the learnings of how we, we leverage it there in the real world at American Red Cross, also then being able to apply that at a number of different industries across the years over these uh, past several years. So what we're looking to, to show you today is a little bit about us at AIA. Um, share uh, the understanding there of what the landscape is for code and where it's moving and share some of the use cases that we're seeing. You know, we, we get to see a, a wide breadth of uh, implementations for Power Platform and for business applications. And so we definitely have a, a good insight and trigger on what the industries are doing across a number of industry verticals, both commercial and federal. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with any questions that you might have and uh, some next steps to how we may be able to help you. Awesome. So this is just a little bit about AIS at a glance. We do everything from advise and implement and manage uh, for things uh, spanning migration and innovation to security and data. Um, we celebrated four years this year, which is a huge milestone, and we're nearing about a thousand employees. Um, we've had the pleasure of experience across enterprises that span from Department of Defense and federal civilian to healthcare and financial services and insurance. Um, we've been a Microsoft partner since 1994. We've been working really closely with those product teams. We worked with Azure back in 2008 before it was even Azure. It still was under codename Red Dog. And we've been working with business applications for a while too. Uh, we helped write the Power Platform Adoption Framework white paper and RPA implementation white paper uh, alongside our counterparts at Microsoft. As a partner, not a vendor, uh, at the core of everything that we do are your business and mission goals. We've been known to quite literally innovate ourselves out of a job, as in if we can get your goals done faster and with less manpower, we will do it because we know that uh, there's more to come with results and relationships at the forefront of our engagements. Uh, not to spend too much time about us, just wanted to give you some background. Uh, I'll pass it off to Nick to talk a little bit about the current and future state of low code, and then we'll dive into use cases. Awesome, thanks, Michaela. And so, you know, as we think about Power Platform and where it's going, we first have to understand where Power Platform sits today. Uh, and so often, I think we consider um, maybe the Power Platform as just one aspect or maybe a, a silo in and of itself 
but it's really part of a larger Microsoft One Cloud. So it, it all starts at the base, right? Microsoft Azure, that, that whole cloud compute, uh, being able to have all of these services available to us that you can pick and choose and pay for these services, even down to the second of consumption. Built on top of Microsoft Azure, we've got this great ecosystem of developer tools from uh, the, the landscape with GitHub to some really cool pieces there with VS Code and the transformation that's taking place there. Um, being able to, the, the low code end, being able to leverage Power Platform where Microsoft is truly fulfilling their mission to be able to empower people everywhere to do more. So Power Platform in, encompassing Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, Virtual Agents. We've seen about now Power Pages, right? Um, all sorts of things that are really that application of uh, empowering people to do more. Built on top of Power Platform, uh, we've got Dynamics. So when we're looking for being able to have a ready to go out of the box solution for being able to work with uh, a formal CRM, um, being able to have customer management, sales, uh, field service. There's the, the, the out of the box capabilities available by Dynamics. Take that a step further and, and think about now for your own industry and that's where the industry specific componentry comes in. Microsoft has a great uh, story for being able to focus in on various industry uh, verticals and being able to already have prepackaged ready to go and ready to deploy solutions into your tenant uh, that you can leverage, that take and scale across the full breadth of the Microsoft One Cloud. For example, if you're in a health insurance space or a health care space, being able to have back-end services in Azure, being able to uh, already leverage some of the Azure Health Data Workspace, uh, innovative chatbot functionality, being able to have dynamics instances that speak directly to the personas of your users, whether they're patients uh, interfacing through a portal or through individuals that are on your back end, whether it be medical care professionals. Uh, and that's just one solution area, one industry. Uh, they have got these industry specific areas across the stack. So it's definitely something worth to check out. And now that we understand where Power Platform fits within the Microsoft One Cloud, I'd love to just kind of share you know, where we traditionally see that sweet spot being for Power Platform. If we look at the cloud adoption framework for Azure, you know, we can see this uh, kind of almost decision pyramid here of uh, all the different scenarios and use cases of where you might consider cloud computing for your uh, solution, whether it's a modernization effort or re-envisioning. But when we think then about how do we apply Power Platform to this, that sweet spot tends to be here in the middle, right? If we're looking at kind of the replacing an existing system with another, perhaps it's just putting in dynamics in place, uh, being able to rebuild an existing solution by reimagining it there with new uh, capabilities and maybe a new workflow altogether, and being able to then, of course, refactor existing applications. Um, Power Platform, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to completely rip and replace your existing solution. It can certainly just mean that it's one piece of the puzzle being able to connect to your existing systems where they are, being able to add capability, being able to enhance the data that you already have, being gleaning across with some of the AI capabilities to bring more insights. So it's some pretty neat things um, as far as for all the areas and breadth of what Power Platform can do. Well, let's take a look at what some of the research shares is coming up ahead. So Gardner has some pretty cool studies out there uh, Forrester and Gartner both, but you know, thinking about what Gartner sees here for these next few years in the uh, in the landscape, they've identified really three core areas that they see uh, all low code offerings really seeking to attain to. One of those being democratization um, and hyper automation and third business. Let's unpack that just a bit. Think about the democratization. Again, it speaks to Microsoft's core vision and mission of empowering people everywhere to do more. So as we think about all of the breadth of services that are available in Azure, the more that we begin democratizing access to each of those, the more that we're able to empower others to take advantage of the capability that they have to offer. And so we begin to see more and more capability uh, surfaced and made visible for end users to use within other uh, products, as, such as certainly Power Platform. We see things such as 
some of loop, com loop components coming into Microsoft Teams, right? So all of this functionality becoming more visible and available. In fact, uh, Gartner shows that by the uh, year 2027, that we should see about 80% of the user base of many of these development tools being non-IT, IT developers. Uh, that could be professional um, kind of technologists or even from a true business end persona. Hyper automation is being able to take not just a, uh, a whole process and digitize it, it's the ability to abstract that out, to be able to take an overall enterprise process and be able to identify all the individual parts and pieces. It's not saying that you have to necessarily uh, replace a human from start to finish. It's saying, how can we take the individual components of a process and identify the manual tasks that are non-value adding that a person is having to do as part of their day? And how can we enhance those to be able to enhance the work that the person can do, be able to help fuel the experience that they're able to have with your customers. So hyper automation comes in with being able to digitize document processing, being able to take a manual point and click uh, experience and being able to leverage perhaps RPA. It's being able to surface a chat experience with a customer or being able to even provide a customer service support agent with the information that they need to be able to service a customer right from the front end. Composable business is that this ability to be able to look across a complex system, similar to hyper automation, but being able to look at a solution from a technological standpoint and being able to break that down, disassemble these complex systems into bits and pieces and being able to rapidly bring those back together. The reality is that your tech landscape is probably not sitting within a single vendor. It's probably sitting across multiple solutions. Perhaps you're leveraging Salesforce. Perhaps you're leveraging Dynamics. Perhaps you're leveraging SAP. You shouldn't have to lock yourself into a single vendor. You should be able to think quickly across all the different tooling that you're using and figure out how you can identify the gaps and be able to plug and play with the solutions across where your data lives. And so Power Platform, of course, is a great use case for that, of being able to rapidly uh, look at, at all the components that make up your larger system landscape and be able to quickly interchange, or being able to quickly slot in maybe a UI with the Power App, uh, being able to leverage some uh, of what Dataverse has to be able to trigger and orchestrate business events across systems, no matter where that data lives. So Nick, Gartner also says by 2027, at least 50% of low-code investments will be directed at supporting you know, packaged business capabilities. And that's up from only 5% uh, in 2021. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the use cases where uh, we've got you know, a variety of audiences from product development and pro devs to the actual end users to business users kind of using these across different uh, use cases or scenarios? Absolutely, yeah. So I think that's the benefit of what we've been able to do at AIS is we get the opportunity. Uh, and it's really a blessing. We get to work with so many different customer types. Um, you know, 50% on the federal side, 50% on the commercial side, you know, highly regulated industries, nonprofits. Uh, we get the opportunity to work with them all. And so being able to see what works with one, what maybe doesn't work with another, uh, it's really been pretty cool to see some of the use cases that have come out. So let's just go ahead and dive into some of these here. So this first one here, have you ever thought about what happens when your insurance rates change, why they change, and really the impact that that means across the insurance company itself? You know, insurance changes, those rates change for a variety of reasons, whether it's perhaps a um, you know, an increase in claims inside of a certain geographic area, maybe there's some statutory changes, um, state regulations, right? All of these things influence the reason for why rates change and adjust. But when they do change, there's a lot that the business has to adapt to. So things like updating the website, updating the mobile app, being able to change some of the internal business processes, updating the call center scripts. These are all business events uh, where actions across the different departments have to take place in order for a successful product change. And this isn't just in the insurance industry. Many organizations have 
these far wide reaching changes that are impactful across their enterprise. What we were able to do with a, a rather large insurer was being able to help meet them where they were at with their legacy application, uh, meeting the output of these rate changes. So picture this, you've got a mainframe system that calculates and provides the output of all of the rate change data. That data has to go somewhere. Well, it was being largely tracked in Excel sheets. That those Excel sheets that were being manually passed there via email or, or through conversations. And so there was a, a the uh, kind of this almost inability to be able to for stakeholders to be able to see um, at a moment's time where the, this whole product change stood. We were able to digitize that for them, leveraging data flows and some ingestion techniques. We were able to bring that data there into Dataverse. So as the outputs come directly from that legacy system, they automatically go right there into that common data store. We built a model-driven app on top, providing a single view. Using business process flows in Power Automate, we were able to then automate not just the actual kind of passing between tasks, but also record and almost timestamp right, the status in between those. So now where they had, didn't necessarily, they weren't able to gauge the true life cycle of the product change, now they've got that visibility. They can go back across that data using tools like Power Automate's Process Advisor to be able to see where the bottlenecks lie, right? They can get that, those AI insights to be able to see where they should focus now from a lean perspective of being able to try and reduce the value detracting activities and increase the value add activities. Power BI, we were able to layer that on top so that now they do have that true ability to forecast ahead and be able to see what are the true dates of completion for these milestones. Where are the uh, kind of that, where's that information exchange living? Uh, and some of the different key pieces there. When it comes to legacy systems, you know, with this into individual organization here, you know, we, there's a lot of different um, connectors, right, that are available to you. So here's just some examples of uh, some systems that we have integrated with, right? Whether it's integrating with SAP, Oracle as your data store there, um, modernizing Lotus Notes, being able to integrate directly with SharePoint as your document store. Um, all uh, kind of pieces here that are very commonplace that maybe it'll ring some bells for you. Let's take a look at the next use case. So while we took a look at kind of modernizing a, a large process right on top of an existing legacy system what about from a development end all too often i think we hear of low code as being associated with a citizen developer kind of persona right and oh it's just for the business user to use it's been interesting as we've gotten the opportunity here to work with a startup within a large insurance payer uh, where they've been able to leverage low code to change the way in which the development life cycle appears. So picture this, they've got a backlog where they're building a mobile application front end for patients and they've got then a back end need or the ability to integrate uh, like the back end administrative functions. So as so a back end app, right? Um, as this, this uh, development's in, in flight for the patient facing mobile application, there's the backlog that still sits, right? And it's been there for, uh, quite an ongoing time of, of this need to be able to uh, update data within the app from an administrative persona. It's a startup, right? Things are moving quickly. And so a, a couple scenarios here. A, a patient needs to be able to update information in their profile regarding their insurance eligibility. If that required a, a ticket in a, a, a DevOps board to be able to have a systems engineer make that change. A customer maybe needs to update uh, certain profile data or even billing data. That was another ticket. And so every day, these uh, individuals within the startup team, the dev team, were having to meet to kind of triage through those. A valuable time that they could have then been able to focus on the actual development itself. So we were able to kind of accelerate what they were able to do by providing the customer service team members with an application or a multiple that they were able to make those changes themselves real time with the patients there on the phone so that those patients could then 
as, as they're hanging up with that call, they're able to then leverage the app moving forward. What was neat is that this isn't a matter of creating additional technical debt. We're having rework down the road, and I'll show you kind of what that looked like. How that unfolded. Uh, it's the ability to work together, and we have a few teams and fusion development. You know, it's a you can use low code as part of your pro code, pro dev experience and solution. With Power Platform, there's some integrations that just make sense. They just make sense to leverage. And with this particular um, customer, they were able to make take advantage of quite a few of these, uh, being able to leverage Synapse with Power Platform. So while you've got data that's being brought in to Power BI, having that data uh, connecting to the, the bring your own data lake environment, right? Being able to have that data pushed, uh, being able to take data that's being saved by a model-driven app for patient clinical care was another model-driven app that we were able to um, help them put together there and have that data pushed into Synapse, right? So being able to push that data to build up their larger data lake and their data footprint. As they've got this application, you know, there's not necessarily the need to duplicate data. They can keep the data where it's at. So in the example of being able to update patient records, certainly we've got all of the connectors that Power Platform has, but we also have virtual tables as a means of being able to make these real-time updates. If you haven't heard of virtual tables yet, check it out. It's a really cool way that even with a model draft, be able to have uh, read and write to a SQL database read and write to a SharePoint list. So that, that data uh, is not having to be duplicated there in Dataverse. It lives where it's at, and your application can then help augment. The coolest piece that I had the most fun with was the iterative development aspect. Being able to start in Power Platform and end in Azure. I'll show you what I mean. So in the use case of a a patient user profile living in Azure B2C and needing updated, we were able to make a simple Canvas app. Canvas app starts right by making this HTTP call to the growth API. We slot that in inside of a custom call there in the HTTP action power automate. So by day two, from day one to day two of knowing about the problem to solving the problem for the customer service agent, they now have an app that they're able to use and work with the user, right? Work with that patient. Um, so it's no longer a, an ongoing need, right? But how can we then set this up for the future so that they can then scale for if they choose to build out a more custom backend uh, facing app, a custom, custom web backend rather, um, or if they choose to scale it out more with Power Platform. So we take that, that uh, kind of initial MVP, right? And we take that HTTP call, we ship that over to an Azure function. All we're doing is copying and pasting the call, putting it in some wrapper there um, for what was essentially a, a Python script, uh, being able to now we've got the Azure function. We update the Power Automate to be able to trigger the Azure function. Shifting over, now we got the, the Azure function. Let's have that called by a custom connector, right? And what we've done there is we've been able to create that abstraction. I didn't have to do any extra development, right? It's just building on each uh, prior step. And so now at this point, the business users can create additional flows. They can create even enhancements to the Power App by leveraging the custom connector. Meanwhile, what are we doing? Well, we're going in and adding then uh, some of the custom endpoints for access and create some true API endpoints to be able to trigger that Azure function. Right? And so now what we're left with is great. From day two, the customer service agent was able to use a Power App to trigger and make a change in Azure B2C. But from the time onward, right now they've got the ability to certainly leverage a Power App with Power Automate uh, and Power Automate rather on top of this custom connector calling API management services, which is triggering that Azure function. They also now have the ability as they're progressing with some of the custom web dev to be able to hit Azure API management services in the Azure function. So being able to, to quickly iterate across, and I'm hoping that you can see now where, where we're able to solve the business problem in day two, we're not looking at rework on each iteration. We're literally taking the work done on the prior and using it to be able to apply towards extending. Rapid development from a pro code, pro dev angle. 
Final use case here I want to share with you is about document management and uh, maybe more of that uh, flavor about making some of your backend processes more transparent and visible to your external customers. We worked with a large military branch there, US military branch, uh, around a, a specific need for service men and women. When a service member needs to be discharged for medical reasons and essentially go out on disability, there's a lengthy process involved. And prior, that process involved a lot of back and forth between the service member and paralegals. It involved a lot of interaction between medical team members, the service members, and also paralegals. And there was a lengthy process where there wasn't much visibility, meaning that the service member was often left not knowing uh, necessarily what task was next for them to complete. Do they have all the documentation in place they needed? Where is that in the whole process for them uh, so that they're not kind of left hanging, right? And so they had this very manual process that was involved with a lot of just phone call outreach, mailing of information back and forth. And what we were able to do for uh, this customer was being able to build a portal as that external front end for the customers, meaning the service members, to log in and, and they can identify exactly the tasks that are needed for them to complete or the tasks that someone else is helping to complete on their behalf. All of the documentation that they need to upload and submit is available there in the portal. So they can access the documentation that was there prior or that they've already submitted plus the documentation that they need to submit moving forward. Now, for the paralegal team, they've got a model-driven app where they're able to, again, manage that business process. They're able to track all the activities, and they're able to see the interactions that have taken place, right, between having a phone call made by one team member, seeing that uh, maybe they've reached out to that uh, service member, and now perhaps returning phone call from another. So being able to leverage the idea of Power Platform to connect to existing systems when they're there, creating a data store for you when you don't have uh, an existing back end, but being able to bring transparency to your end customer of uh, an, what was maybe previously an only internally handled process. The beauty of uh, Power Platform, Dayverse, right, all that's there, um, these things are designed for use even in sensitive scenarios. So if you've got medical data, for example, there's already a common data model schema in place to be able to handle the storage of that medical data. You're already looking at a HIPAA compliance solution. You already have complex roles-based access for various permissioning scenarios. So if chances are you've already got Power Platform in place, whether you know it or not, and yet did you realize that you had a tool in place that already met a lot of these regulatory requirements that you could just go ahead and apply? Mikhail, I'll turn it back over to you and, and maybe you can wrap us up in, in sharing kind of what some next steps are as we've looked at some of these different use cases. Um, you know, maybe some of these resonated with some of the uh, participants here. Maybe some of them uh, didn't and maybe they have some of their own. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Um, next step, really just reach out to us. We're happy to talk to you about, you know, where you're at in your current state, what your desired outcomes are, and how best to get you there, whether it's licensing, use case build out, discovery. Um, we've also got a lot of different options for funding. Um, based on our Microsoft partnership, we can look at what options may be best for you to support those customer projects. Um, and then next, we'll just move into to identifying and then moving forward those use cases. Like Nick talked about, um, we can move something forward in a day and working session in a couple days and get you on the path to really evangelizing, adopting, and getting that ROI out of low code um, based on your business outcomes. So that's really where we're at. Um, Nick, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop that in the chat or reach out directly. You can reach us on our website at AIS.com or reach out directly to sales at AIS.com. We can chat more.